In the previous lecture, we talked about what a genome is. In this lecture, we're going to talk about how a genome changes. And changing a genome is really important because that's how evolution happens. There's a number of different ways this can happen. One way is that there can be errors during DNA replication. Understandably, these are very rare. It's only one in a hundred million bases on average that changes. Another is by spontaneous chemical changes in bases. Bases can be modified either by oxidative products in the cell, by things that interact with them, or just by simple decay. And one example is the deamination of cytosine to produce uracil, and that will cause an error. Finally, there's DNA damage, and there's all sorts of agents called mutagens that can cause these damages, this damage. All of these can cause mutations, and if the daughter and cell inherits that change, it is called a mutant. So the types of chemical mutagens you can have are base analogs, things like fibromyuracil that kind of simulate or look like a base and get incorporated like a T, and then occasionally it faultily pairs like a G, and that causes a mutation. There can also be chemicals that react with DNA that either denaminates it or reacts with it in such a way that then you get incorrect base pairing. And then finally, radiation, like ultraviolet light and ionizing radiation can cause damage to DNA, either pyrimidine dimer formation in the case of ultraviolet light or creating free radicals that attack the DNA and break the chain. So when a mutation happens in the cell, what happens next? If you think about wild type, and again, wild type is just the standard strain that scientists have decided is the normal strain. If there's a change in a cell such that a T is in place of where a C should be, this, if DNA replication occurs one more time, this now becomes a mutant cell. It has a different base there, whereas the other daughter cell will still have the wild type sequence, and this is a mutant daughter cell. Now there is a race between DNA replication and repair systems, and these repair systems can repair damaged DNA. The systems that we're going to talk about are photoreactivation, nucleotide excision, methyl mismatch repair, recombination repair, and translation bypass synthesis, which is also known as SOS repair. So let's get into it. Photo reactivation is straightforward. UV light will hit the DNA, and if it's absorbed, it will cause pyrimidine dimers. In this case, we're looking at a TT dimer. That causes a bubble in the DNA and will cause errors on subsequent replication. There is an enzyme called photolyase that binds to these. It uses light, which is kind of clever since light caused the mutation. There's still light around to fix it. So it uses the light energy to undo this damage and then repair the DNA. If a base somehow changes because of natural decay, modification by chemicals, or by radiation, this damaged base can be removed, and this is called nucleotide excision repair. In this case, the nucleotide is first recognized by DNA glycolase, because obviously it forms a bubble in the DNA. It removes the base, the DNA glycolase then falls off, AP endonuclease comes in, clips out that region, and then DNA polymerase comes in and repairs it. A third system is methyl mismatch repair. This involves three enzymes. MUT-S comes in first and binds to the replication error. If there's a replication error, it won't base pair correctly and there'll be a modified structure of the DNA here. MUT-S can recognize that and bind to it. MUT H then binds to the nearest GATC that is methylated. MUT H and MUT S then form this loop structure. MUT L joins them. MUT H nicks the DNA and exonuclease is then degraded. Now you might want wonder how does the DNA, how does this system know what the newly synthesized strand is? Well, when DNA is first replicated, it is not methylated at these GATC sites. Therefore, MUT-H will only bind to the methylated site 
and therefore it can recognize the newly synthesized piece of D DNA uh, shown here as the red line. That gets degraded and then DNA polymerase comes in and fills it in. Another system is recombination repair. This comes into play when a cell is actively replicating. It comes to a region where there's, there's serious DNA lesion, but there is still the complementary copy there that has the right, correct base pairs. So it goes through this synthesis and then it stops and it realizes there's a problem. There's a retrograde fork, fork regression, so it goes backwards. There's a degradation of the damaged area and then you have this strand exchange. This strand here shown in red has been copied from the region that was damaged on the other side. So it's the correct bases. That is strand is brought over. You then copy this through. There's a strand exchange and then you continue on. In this way, if there's only damage to one strand of the DNA double strand, you can use recombination repair to fix it. Finally, if you have massive damage to the, to the DNA, such that like one strand is missing in this case, and then the other strand has damage on it, and the, the uh, DNA polymerase can't get through this, DNA polymerase, the replication complex will stop. It will fall off, wreck A binds, and then a different polymerase comes in that doesn't care what's on the other strand. It literally puts in random bases until it's past the lesion and then the DNA polymerase 3 complex comes back in. So you're putting in random bases in this area. You may wonder why do this? If you don't do this, you're dead. So you might as well try and survive by putting in random bases and hoping you can still work. So that's why the system is available, this last ditch effort. Now we have a number of clicker questions to test whether you understand what we've talked about so far. Okay, if you look at this mutation shown on the bottom here, what probably caused this T to G mutation? Here are your choices. Replication, spontaneous chemical changes, irradiation, or oxidative damage. The correct answer is this was probably caused by replication where an incorrect base was inserted across from the G. So how would the cell fix this? Here are your choices. And the correct answer is mismatch repair. This is a mismatch, a mismatch base pairing, and that would be the easiest way to fix it. What probably caused this frame shift mutation? You've put in an extra A as you've copied the DNA. How would the cell fix this? The correct answer is again, methyl mismatch repair. This points something out. In a lot of the times, if you have ba incorrect bases in places like this, the best way to fix them is using mismatch repair. SOS repair is the last ditch effort. Photo repair fixes pyrimidine dimers. Recombination repair is for more serious errors on one strand where there's a number of bases wrong and we'll go from there. Finally, there's a block in the DNA where bases are damaged on one strand and the other strand is mission, missing. How would the cell fix it? The correct answer in this case is it's probably gonna be SOS repair. Now we've talked about ways that small changes in the DNA can happen, where you have a let extra base changes or a couple of bases added. But there are instances where huge tracts of D DNA can come into a genome and be added. And that is by horizontal gene transfer. Now you're familiar with vertical gene transfer, which is basically just the, the transfer of DNA from parent to offspring. Horizontal gene transfer, or also known as lateral gene transfer, is between individuals. This can be done in three ways. Transduction, where DNA is moved by a virus. Transformation, which is the uptake of naked DNA and incorporation into the genome. And conjugation, where DNA moves between two living cells. In a lot of these cases, what's going on is you have an incorporation of DNA into the genome. If the DNA is self-replicating, i.e. it's a plasmid, it can maintain itself and you wouldn't use this system. However, if a linear piece of DNA needs to be integrated into the genome, it will be integrated by recombination. 
in that there's two types. There's generalized recombination where you have high DNA homology. It's the identical region or it's a very similar region of DNA that's being brought in, let's say a trip A gene or something, and it matches to that to trip A gene in the wild in the cell, and then there's a recombination. There can also be site-specific recombination where there's short sequences of DNA homology, and those are then used to recombine uh, the DNA in. This will happen sometimes when you have, let's say, two stretches of DNA that are similar between two, like a chromosome and something that's moved in, and then you have a recombination event that incorporates a whole area of DNA outside of that region. What I want you to know from it is that even linear DNA that comes into the cell can be brought in by recombination. And this is actually using the recombination repair system to actually put the DNA into the cell. Transformation, again, it's just the uptake of naked DNA actually has an historical importance. Fred Griffith reported this phenomenon in 1928 in the Journal of Hygiene. He reported a transforming principle. What he found is if he took live Streptococcus pneumoniae cells and he injected them into a mouse and then waited a few days, the mouse would die. If he heat killed these cells that were smooth colonies on a plate and injected it into a mouse, that had no effect on the mouse. He also noticed like if you struck a plate of strep pneumonia and then looked at them there'd be these smooth colonies and then there'd be these rough colonies and what's happening with the rough colonies is they were no longer making their exopolysaccharide. If you injected these rough cells into a mouse the mouse lived it had no problem. And then he did an interesting experiment. He, heal, he killed smooth cells and he mixed them with rough cells. And when he injected that into the mouse, the mouse died. And what he said is that there was some transforming principle that was from the heat killed smooth cells that was moving over to the rough cells. If he isolated the, cult, the living culture from this dead mouse of the bacterium, what he found was smooth cells only. It was later demonstrated that this transforming principle was DNA, and this was done by Oswald Avery, who reported the results in 1944. Now remember, this was before the nature of hereditary material was known. That wasn't figured out until 1953. Griffith died in the war in 1941 in an air raid before mo most people understood the significance of his discovery. So how does this transformation work? So what happens is in the cell, there'll be free DNA in the environment. It will bind to a DNA binding protein and a single strand will be brought in. Then this single strand has a recade mediated homologous recombination. So it has actually recombined with chromosome. It turns out that Streptococcus pneumoniae and a number of other organisms are naturally competent they will take up DNA from the environment. Neisseria species, Streptococcus, and the others shown here are naturally common cells, and they have this capability of taking things up from the environment. In some ways, this science is a little surprising to me because I would think it's kind of dangerous to just grab random DNA from the environment and shove it into your genome, but it must be of evolutionary advantage, otherwise it wouldn't have continued. Now in the laboratory, we'll also be able to make cells artificially competent. And the way we do that is by using these protocols. Some of them use calcium and a cold shock. So this is a calcium chloride transformation and then a heat shock to force the plasmid into the cells. And it's thought that this heat shock and this cold shock allow pores to open up and the plasmid to move into the cell. There is also induced transformation using electroshock, and this actually works on a wide variety of organisms. You put the cell in the presence of whatever you're trying to move in, and in most cases this is a plasmid, 
and you shock it with electricity. This causes openings and pores in the cells. They will reform and some of them will get this inside them. Both of these protocols, the heat shock protocol and the electroshock protocol, are very low frequency. So this is typically done with plasmids and then you have some selective agent, typically a gene on the plasmid for drug resistance that you select for the organisms that you want. That's transformation, which is the uptake of naked DNA. It can be done in some cells that are naturally transformable, and then it can be done in many different cells using these transformation protocols. Some cells can be transformed using a calcium chloride shock, and many cells can be transformed using electroshock. Transduction is the movement of DNA from one cell to another by a virus. So normally in a viral cycle what happens is the phage comes in, it injects its DNA, this viral DNA then takes over the cell, it breaks it all up and you make many different viral DNA copies. Most of these get inserted into phage heads. Every once in a while the viral packaging machinery makes a mistake and it actually puts a host genome inside a phage head instead of the normal phage. So this will be a little piece of the host genome. Now, the vast majority of these particles will be normal viruses, but a fraction of them will be these transducing particles. If you dilute your, your viral sample and then you add it to cells, this transducing particle will add to a cell and inject naked DNA that's not a virus. Then by homologous recombination, this will actually be incorporated into the genome. This was discovered in 1951 by Norton Zinder and Joshua Lederberg at UW-Madison. You may think this is kind of an artificial laboratory procedure and how likely would it be in the environment? And it turns out there's been good papers that have demonstrated this occurs naturally in Escherichia, Pseudomonas, Rhodococcus, Staphylococcus, and methanothermobacter, among others. So it turns out that transaction is actually a way that DNA does get moved around in the environment. The third and final way of horizontal gene transfer is via conjugation, and this is widespread. Conjugation is the movement of a plasmid or other DNA from one live cell to another. Many plasmids encode the machinery of con conjugation, and this allows them to spread from one organism to another. This conjugation machinery in some instances is not species specific and they can spread broadly within almost all like gram negative bacteria, for example. So how does this work? What happens is the organism that has the conjugatable plasmid will have the genes to synthesize a pelis and this pelis will bind to the cell and then pull it in and a pore gets formed between the two cells, and then a copy of the DNA gets transferred to the other cell. So the donor, which is called an F plus cell because it has the F plasmid, will find a recipient that is F minus, will go through this transformation process, or the, go through this conjugation process, and by the end, both cells are now F plus, and they can then both mate with further cells. So you can spread this plasmid throughout a population. Again, this was discovered in 1946 by Joshua Lederberg. Now it also happens that this F plasmid can recombine with the chromosome if there's areas of homology, and there are a few. And in those cases, you make what's called an HFR cell. And in these cases, the cell, the HFR cell, the donor, will mate with the F minus cell form the conjugation apparatus, but instead of just sending over the F plasmid, it starts sending over the whole chromosome. Depending on how long the cells are melded together, a significant amount of the chromosome can transfer over and then recombine. Now this does not convert the F minus cell to an F plus cell, but it does transfer over a large amount of DNA that can then recombine. So it was called an HFR cell because you have a high frequency of changing phenotypes because of the recombination. 
The plasmid we've been talking about is called an F factor, and this is a conjugatable plasmid. It is about 99 kb in size, and there's generally one to two copies of the cell. You will see a transfer region that encodes the transfer functions, including the PLIS. There is an ORET, which is the origin of transfer, and this is where the transfer starts. There is an OREV, which is the origin of replication. You'll notice that this contains a transposon, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and it also contains these insertion sequences. And these are the regions of homology that actually allow it to recombine with the chromosome of its host. This plasmid contains a toxin antitoxin system to help it to be maintained in the cell, and its transfer takes about five minutes. So the result of this is microbial genomes are dynamic. And a set of terms has come up to taking into account this difference. There is the core genome that's common to all members of the species. There is the accessory genome that's found in some but not all members of the species. And then there is the pan genome. Then you can pair all the known sequences of a species and it's the entire set of genes found in that species. How dynamic are these genomes? Is there a way we can tell if DNA sequence has come from somewhere else? If, you know, it's very easy to sequence, the, sequence all these genomes, how can we tell what is the core genome and what is the pan genome? It turns out there's actually a really easy way to do this. Each microbe has a typical pattern of sequences, what I'll call a signature. And it is, they will choose, have a preference, a G plus C content that's typical. And because of that, they'll choose common codons. And so therefore you can recognize a signature pattern in a genome that indicates it's part of the core genome. If you get DNA from another organism in, it's going to have a different signature and you can detect that. There are programs that have been written to detect these sequences and where these signatures suddenly shift. And that means that the DNA is from a different organism. A recent one, the Mean Shift Genomic Island Predictor, uses a highly accurate system and it can predict if you have a horizontal gene transfer in your genome, if you have regions that are pan genome versus core genome. Here's the reference for it. And we're going to actually run this program now and demonstrate what it can do. Okay, I have started up the Mean Shift Genome Island Predictor, which is a Java program that you can actually have access to if you go to the reference and you want to do this on your own. I've then opened up an FNA file, and this is the genome of Bacillus anthracis that you can actually get online at NCBI. All right, so we've opened it up. I've set up some parameters. These are like the size of fragments that you're looking for, which is about 40,000 40, base pairs. Uh, the number of artificial fragments that you need to see before you call it a genome island, etc. So let's start running it and see what it says. It says there are no genomic islands in Bacillus anthracis. Okay, let's try Corynebacterium diphtheriae. Again, this is another important pathogen. So we now start it with that one, and we go through, and there are a huge number, dozens, of genomic islands in this organism. So there's a, a significant amount of pan genome in this organism. Now let's look at Angonorrhea. Now Neisseria, remember, is an organism that is known to take up uh, DNA from the outside. It's naturally transformable. And it turns out there are no genomic islands by this. Let's try Streptococcus pneumoniae and see what it has. And it has one genomic island. So this organism actually does have a few. Finally, let's look at Vibrio cholera. So we start the process. We look and this organism has a number of regions that don't seem to be part of the core genome. So using these bioinformatic tools, what we found is 
a significant number of organisms that I just grabbed out of the database actually clearly have horizontal, they have had pieces of their DNA come in from other places. Okay, that is it for how the genome changes.